Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm just told my brain is totally empty, so I'll try try to put uh, go on automatic because I've talked so much that I I can um, talk anytime. I just put my brain in neutral. Sometimes my mouth goes off about a half hour uh, before my brain finds out what it said. <laughs> uh, I'm a Mexican, in case you didn't know that. Um. I live in Blythe, California. You all know where that is. Uh, it's um, for God sends you when He's punishing you for asking for stuff. <laughs> Actually, what I'm doing in Blythe is there's a man in Blythe, and you just saw him bringing me up here, take care of me. And uh, he's a great guy. We're both dedicated to making me happy. Uh, I, uh, I've got him convinced he never had it so good, and the woman's place is in the mall. I mean, that's what I'm doing, that's what I'm doing in Blythe. I wasn't always in Blythe. I'm, I'm really a transplant. I'm from Orange County originally. And of course, from California, the land of, uh, fruits and nuts. <laughs> Got my own drink. I was born in a barrio. You know what a barrio is? It's a little uh, Mexican community, and in the days that I was raised there, we didn't let any Anglos in, and they weren't too anxious to come in there either. I was of the generation where we used to join the gangs and beat, it, beat each other up and call it fun, and I think we're still doing it uh, uh, today. I was born into a family that wasn't ready for me then and isn't ready for me now. And, and my, to the day my mother died, she never thought I was an alcoholic. She said, you were always that way. Uh, I was born a long, long time ago. I'm really a young person in an old container. And uh, I was born when they kept the mothers in the hospital a whole week. And when they came home with this baby, they st- still didn't have a name for me. And the reason for that is because my daddy wanted to name me after his girlfriend. And my mother's narrow-minded. My, <laughs> my mother was of a little purple lip variety. Not a little... Not not little blue lips, little purple lips, because she's a Mexican. And I had an older sister that was perfect, and they always told her what to do, and she always did it right, and she screwed it up for me. Because I never knew how to be good until after I was bad. And then it's too late for me. They're always bidding on me. And I don't know I'm a better child. I thought that's what you get for not knowing how to be good. Now, they were divorced when I was seven, and my mother used to send me to the nuns so they could teach me to be a lady. And what the nuns thought was a lady wasn't appealing to me then, and it isn't appealing to me now. And uh, not only did I did I uh, not know how to be good, but as soon as they said, thou shalt not, I may not have thought of doing it before, but as soon as they said, thou shalt not, I had an overwhelming desire to do it, and I couldn't get it out of my mind till I did it. And so people used to like to dare me because they knew I always did it. And so somebody dared me, and I raised the nun's skirts, see what she wore under all them clothes, and they 86 me from catechism. And I got home and got my bidding. And then the next day when I got to school, all the kids thought I was terrific. I was so surprised to get all the attention, and everybody's laughing in my class and carrying on, and it felt wonderful. Me, I had always felt invisible. You see, me, I was born with an emptiness in my soul. There was a yearning, a longing to be loved, to be wanted, and to be accepted. As a little child, I used to worship my mother and wanted her approval so desperate, so desperate. And it seemed that nothing I did was ever enough. The overruling emotion of my life that I remember uh, that that was with me uh, long into this program was of hugging myself and rocking like a wounded animal, just wailing, because there was something horribly wrong with me. And I didn't know what it was, and I didn't know how to fix it. And it seemed that I always looked 
uh, for love. I was always so hungry for love that I ached inside that I would give my heart to anybody that would take it, you see. I always looked for somebody to take care of that lonely, horrible something inside of me. I'm one that believes that I always had the pilot lit. All I ever needed was the fuel. Now, my mother remarried a man that was starting to get funny, and uh, and I told her that he's looking here, what, what this man is trying, and, and she said, you are a liar. You've always been a liar, and so I was. Uh, but when I told the truth, I expected to be believed, and, and I wasn't. Uh, and so I felt alone like a, a leaf in the wind, uh, and I started to think, now I'm going to go with my daddy. Now my daddy was over in the San Fernando Valley about 60 miles from where we were, and I used to think that if I only could get to my daddy, everything going to be all right. So I went off to my daddy when I was about 12 years old, and my daddy was over in the San Fernando Valley where he'd taken up light housekeeping with a lady with eight kids, and all he wants is one more. And he used to take people up north to pick grapes and prunes, and we were fruit pickers. And God made two kinds of Mexicans as fruit pickers and non-fruit pickers. And I'm not a fruit picker. They try to, they try to make a fruit picker out of me, and it didn't take. And I, in fact, uh, um, I've gotten really close to a lot of things I really like, but work ain't one of them. I've never been in any danger of getting addicted to work. <laughs> Richard knows that. So he says if he ever feels like he's, like he's going to croak, he's going to run to the freeway. And, and eat a truck so I can get double indemnity on his insurance. <laughs> so he's a nice guy. Don't worry, girls. I'm one that had to kiss a thousand prints and turn them into toads. I always, I don't know how I did magic on them. This is the first toad I ever kissed to turn into a prince. Now, we stayed beyond the season with the Gallo brothers in a place called Livingston in Northern California, where I used to pick grapes, and there was uh, those those vineyards where as far as the eye could see, get out. it was horrible, horrible. But the good news is, we stayed beyond the season with the Gallo brothers, and they gave my ca- dad a case of sherry wine, and somebody must have said, thou shalt not. <laughs> I had a big water glass look like that orange juice glass today. I had a big water glass of that sherry wine, and when it went down, it went boom. I, mean, I felt like I put my finger in the light socket. I mean, everything felt great. And I thought, man. And so, you know, I thought, eh, I'm like Sean was saying, I'm not a, a sipper, I'm a chug-a-lugger. Man, I chug a that thing down. And then I want more, because you know the next one's going to be better. I just, that's all I really wanted from life is to feel the way I did that very minute. But something happened on my pig from the get-go. I chug along that and probably chug along another and then it's the next day. I don't know what happened. I come to the next day, you know, I'm from the Pachuco days where they got the big hairdos. I come to the next day and that hair is all over my head. <laughs> God, I come to the next day and I drink water and get drunk all over again. I fell in the mud with my clothes. God only knows what happened to me. And I knew that something terrible had happened. Now, I'm just alone with my family, but I had a sense of shame of being dirty that went all the way through me. And it started a lifetime of looking at people's eyes, looking at their faces, terrified to know what I had done and terrified not to know. And I had a sense of shame of being dirty that went all the way through me. And I don't know what to do with this emotion. The only way I ever handle anything is to put a defiant, belligerent, arrogant look about me and say, I don't care, I don't give a damn. But I always cared. It seemed that my center was always very soft. It was shortly after that I went back home to my mother, and she told me I could not come home because they'd been free of me over a year, and I wasn't wanted. And now I'm just a child. I'm 13 years old, and my life seems to be over. And I start living here and there with people who would take me in for a little while. At those days, we weren't doing like kids do today and just go someplace and live wherever they can. In those days, the families would take people like me in for a little while, and only for a little while because it wasn't long before uh, they also wanted me gone. This is the time 
when I discovered the, the booze and the boys and the cha-cha-cha. God, I love the booze and the boys and the cha-cha-cha. I was one of the original topless, bottomless dancers in them parties we used to have. And I don't even get paid for it. I don't even remember it. But the girls were always so willing to tell me what they did the next day, so I used to beat them up, and then they didn't tell me, because violence is I, the way I handled anything that was embarrassing and humiliating. Also, in those days, I didn't know how to work. I was just a child. I, I used to do babysitting, but I discovered a burglary. It seemed to be a good idea at the time. I really was not a bad person, but your things were much more interesting than mine. And it was fun to go into people's houses when they weren't there and look for treasures. And uh, I really was surprised when the state of California discovered me. They didn't understand that my case was different. I was just having fun. They took me before the judge, and there said my mother and all the mother purple-lipped people with that look in their eyes, you know, we told you so look in their eyes. And I'm sitting there slip, slick, hip, and cool with, with a wish to wear fatigues. And, you know, I've always been brought in the beam. So you can imagine with them fatigues and army shirts. And we put the collar up and just slouched down, you know, slick, hip, and cool. And the judge asked me, well, young lady, what do you think we ought to do with you? Well, I slide down on my chair, put my collar up, and say, you're the judge, man. You ought to know. That was the wrong person to have that kind of an attitude. <laughs> He sent me and my attitude to do a little bit of time for the state of California. <laughs> they didn't understand my case was different. And so I, I'm supposed to do nine months because it's my first offense and I'm still uh, just barely 18. And um, But I don't know how to be good there either, so I do 13 months. I thought I'd be the only gray-haired little old lady in that for, uh, girls' reformatory. When I, they finally let me out, I took my first inventory. I don't have a job, I don't have a home, I don't have a, any money and a, um, or education, and I'm thinking, what in order? I can't go through with it. I better go out and find me a husband, because God knows I need somebody to take care of me. And I went out looking for a husband in places that husbands are not to be looked for. <laughs> and unfortunately for both of us, I found one. And there's a certain kind of guy who always caught my attention. Usually they got big muscles and wear tight T-shirts. They walk with a little slouch, got tattoos, mother, born to lose. Huh? <laughs> they got greasy hair and shiny and eyes. And they look at you and got all teeth and smile. And they walk with a little hair hop, don't they? Say, what's happening there, baby? God, it just still makes me get chills all over. <laughs> <laughs> I used to think that look was charisma. Today I know it to be psychosis. <laughs> My sponsor told me for the longest time that you can't make chicken tail out of a chicken shit, but we tried. We tried. <laughs> he built them castles in the air and I lived in them. And three months later we were pregnant and I was married in that order. And he was a mainline heroin user, and you just don't live happily ever after with one of those. Very exciting, but not very happy. He had an idea what a good Mexican wife should be. I had an idea what a good Mexican husband should be, and never the twain shall be. And we both got scars to prove it, because I don't stay home silently. He comes home from them parties. And I tell him about who his mother and grandmother and great grandmother slept with. And he tells me to shut up or he's gonna hit me. And that sure smacks like thou shalt not. So I jump in first. <laughs> so we had quite a, quite an exciting relationship, this man and I. It was kinda like the skunk that jumped, the cat that jumped and the skunk didn't get all he wanted, just all he could stand. That's the way our relationship was. And we were quite equipped with for for, for, my, for parenthood. Now he don't like for me to drink, or he don't like how I get. So he introduces me to little white pills with crosses on them. I don't know what they are, but I sure know what they did to me. I had one eyeball over there and one over there, and I make baby clothes all night long. <laughs> Chew gum. I don't know if I'm chewing gum or the inside of my mouth. You know. I don't. 
smoke cigarettes, drink coffee, clean your house with a toothbrush, and, and dance with a mar and sing with the mariachis and have more darn fun till he comes home and then I remember where he's been and that here it is. Oh, I'll tell you what. When I had my baby, I was tired. <laughs> And they put that baby in my arms. I felt like finally, finally, somebody belonged to me. She belonged to me. I knew this man didn't want to be married. He didn't want to be married to me. That's why he was doing the things that he was doing. And I looked at my baby and I promised her I would never beat her, abandon her, and discard her as I have been. And I meant it with every fiber of my being. If it would have been any different. It would have been for my baby. But I'm an alcoholic. And I am a woman alcoholic. And when I drink, I have absolutely no choices and no rights. When I drink, I'm going to do what's in front of me to do because it's there to do. Because it seems to be a good idea at the time. I never think about prices and I never think about tomorrow. I just know i got to go. I just got to go. And it doesn't matter who is, I, who is in front of me, who I have to walk over to go. I took that play of baby and her sister to places that children should not be taken. Because I'm an alcoholic. As horrible as I think I am, my childhood was, theirs, theirs was certainly much more destructive. And there was many times when I would come home where, uh, when I would have, uh, wouldn't have enough chemicals to kill what I had in the cold water shed. Where I had left their daddy and, uh, they turned into a bar drinking woman. And I know the feeling of degradation and self-loathing that a woman alcoholic goes through when she's unprotected and she drinks in bars. The shame, the trying to hide the shame, trying to pretend it doesn't care. And I would come home, I'd turn the light on in the cold water shack. It was filthy with cockroaches and mice. And in that little shack lived those two little girls that the romance of being a mother had long since died. And the responsibility for them choked me. And I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous by myself. I didn't come here because I destroyed myself. I did destroy two, the light out of two little girls' eyes. That's what I did because I'm an alcoholic. They um, had the big eyes of the children uh, of alcoholics of my type where they didn't know whether I was going to hug them or where I was going to hit him. And many times I would start hitting, and it was like like a sheet came down. And all that inner frustration, all that inner rage for so many things came out, and I wouldn't stop, and I couldn't stop, until there was beggings and pleadings and tears and blood. And I died inside when a semblance of sanity would return, because I knew there was that I was ruining their life forever and uh, there wasn't anybody else that could protect them from me but me and I was the one they needed protection from. You see, these are the stories, these are the pictures that are before my eyes that keep me grateful for what has been bestowed upon me in spite of me in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. The blessing that have been come into our life, that has come into my life, because I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. But my journey was, and my uh, drinking was not over. After five years of this, my husband, who had been in Texas getting the cure some, before it was someplace, and he said, he started sending pictures home. You know, there's nobody like the dope fiend when they clean up. Don't they clean up good? They lift weights and they're looking good. And he starts sending pictures home and says, babe, this time it's going to be different. And so it was. And, of course, he came home, wanted to take up right where we left off. Now, by this time, you couldn't stop me from drinking no matter what. So he knifed me. That's the way we had. I mean, he wouldn't have, if he didn't love me, he wouldn't have knifed me. And he knifed me and uh, I carried a gun. I don't know what I would have done if he had confronted me, but. Anyway, four days later, he called and apologized, so we ran off to Las Vegas to get married. I mean, that's what you do with. How else can you make up? <laughs> and we moved about 20 miles from Mama in a little 
community called uh, Mira Loma. I'll tell you, Blythe has been called the, the uh, armpit of California. But my experience in Mira Loma is a little different part of the anatomy. At least that was, <laughs> at least that was my experience there. You see, every hope and every dream died in that little house in Mira Loma. Uh, I mean, I married him in the Catholic Church. But a little ranch with the chickens and the horses, and we were going to be farmers, it's so Finn and I. We even joined the PTA. I mean, we were going to be like everybody else. I'm a firm believer. You can place me in the best of circumstances, but sooner or later I have to create whatever is inside of me, because it's inside the, of me the madness lies. And it isn't long before that life gets to be too tight and too unbearable. When he starts making his run to the connection, Back in Orange County, I started making the runs to the wineries. The best thing about Mira Loma, it sits right in the middle of four wineries. And I used to go, and there was a, uh, I had a kindred spirit that used to sell me the five gallons of wine. He come out of this, this, it looked like a dungeon, and he had little vapors coming out of it, and he let me taste everything before I had to do, uh, buy anything, and that was what, well, then I'd buy my five gallons and I'd go home. This is the time where uh, every hope and every dream went out of my life. This is the time when I learned with the word agony, despair, and utter loneliness. I know those words. I learned them in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I re- experienced them in a dirty bedroom in Miraloma, where I drank and I drank and I drank, and my body's drunk and my mind's in agony. I had come to the place in my life where no amount of poison would kill the madness inside of me. And, it, and I just got so tired. I started going to churches. I started praying. I started reading the Bible. I, I've been dunked and dipped and sprayed and feathers and flowers and, and nothing ever took. And I just got tired. And I came home one day and, and uh, uh, I, this man was home. He hadn't been home for a while and, and he was home and I told him I was going to kill myself. And he said, okay, we have a slight communication problem. And I went, and I went and cleaned my house. And I went and took a bath. Do you know what that means to me? To people like me? To go and take a bath? I hadn't bathed or washed my, brushed my teeth or changed the sheets or, or washed clothes in forever. I just passed out and came to. But I just in case I died, I didn't want them to find out how I was living. Now, I had run off everybody. Everybody in my family for two years had not spoken to me. And I went to bed relieved. It was the only time that I had any kind of good feeling during that time when I knew I wasn't going to have to do this anymore. So when I came to a couple of days later, I wasn't glad to be alive. I was enraged, and I felt so utterly hopeless, especially when this man had been in bed with me both nights. And never once did he consider taking me to a doctor or to a hospital. This man wanted me gone just as much as me, and I couldn't go. I came to, and I couldn't drink, and I couldn't be sober, and I couldn't live, and I couldn't even die. I couldn't even die, and came to on what has got to be the loneliest day of my life. And I just sobbed, and I just sobbed. You know, that very day, I've looked upon that day, I realized that my higher power has always had his hand upon my life. It takes what it takes. And some of us are so especially stupid and hard-headed that God just has to knock that all out of us. And it seems like it, you know, like when you get your ears plugged out, you got to go like this to unplug them. And I think that had to happen to me. Because that very day, there was a, that day there was a knock on the door as a lady from the PTA. If there was somebody I didn't want to see, is a lady from the PTA. <laughs> and there stood Mrs. Clean. And, and she said, hi. And I must have been downwind from her. <laughs> she said, what is wrong? So in my moment of weakness, I let her in and told her what was wrong about this SOB, is what I told her. And uh, I stayed, and I, she's asking me, and I tell her and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and I'm used to talking and people getting a glazed look in their eyes. You know, I, I know that's part of being a talker. And, uh, but when I get scared is when they come alive again. And this lady came alive again, and I knew I had said something too, I said one thing too many. I went, uh-oh. And, uh, 
What she asked me is if I ever heard I owe none. And I never heard I owe none. But I got the idea that if I went there, he would straighten up. So she stayed with me, and she cleaned me up, and she took me to al And somehow I didn't fit in in al I, uh, I felt a little bit like a whole wood in a nunnery. There was absolutely no identification between me and them square bras. They were, they were nice ladies, and they hugged me. And I smiled at them. I had heard some place that I had had a beautiful smile. Probably somebody wanted more than my smile. And uh, I smiled at him, kind of those, the lights are on, but there's nobody home smile. <laughs> I found out years later they used to laugh at me. I thought I had them fooled. But you know, them nice, clean ladies, they hugged me. And they held my hand and we prayed. And I, by this time, I'm having spiritual experiences. It's also probably called hallucinations. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm thinking we're all going to go to heaven together. Uh, and just kind of weird stuff like that. Now, I don't hear anything, obviously. And uh, every so often, this lady one brings me there. And, and I don't know how long a time that was, but uh, I don't hear anything. One day, I hear the word uh, release. So I went home and told him in detail how I was, how I was going to release him. So he used to sleep with his clothes on and a knife under the pillow. And I would sit in a corner with a big black coat on and watch him. When he'd be a dozing off, I'd go take a little peek and he'd go, Whoa! And oh God, I loved it. It felt so good. Some, almost sexual, it felt so good, you know? He would say unkind things to me. He'd say, baby, I may have a monkey on, on my back, but you got an orangutan. <laughs> One day I came home and he was gone. He took everything with him. He wasn't planning on coming back. And because bad luck comes in bunches, it was that time they kicked me out of Alamon. They found out there was a fraud among them. And they designated this poor soul that had inflicted me upon them to take me to, to their husbands who they didn't like either. And <laughs> talk about perception. And so she come and picked me up one day and cleaned me up and took me to this old dilapidated old house in Pomona, about 30 miles from where we, I was living. And this old house, and they took me around the back because I'm a Mexican. And then uh, um, they took me through the kitchen where all the melanons are standing around doing what melanons are doing there. And uh, uh, I don't look at their eyes. I'm not going to give them the satisfaction of me seeing the triumph in their eyes. I know what they're going to look like. They're going to look at me like my mother and them people looked at me. I just look at my feet and I walk through them ladies. So full of shame. And I walk through them ladies into a room where I heard the sounds of Alcoholics Anonymous. The very first thing that attracted me to you was the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. You see, there's music and there's words here. And I never heard the words. I just heard the music. I listened to that belly laughter, that smile that reaches the soul, that shine in the eyes, and that happy talk. And those are the sounds of Alcoholics Anonymous. They were laughing. They were laughing. They were laughing. Do you know how long it had been since I had laughed? Since I had had anything, anything to laugh about, and it drew like a magnet the music of this room. And I just sat back there and let it wash over my soul, and I hungered for it. I just thought, it's too bad I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> if there's another name for the disease that you and I have, I said I ain't got it. Now, I know I'm weird and different and three steps ahead of the man with a butterfly net. I just knew I was not an alcoholic. I used to be an alcoholic. When I was a kid and had all them blackouts, I used to be an alcoholic. But I cured it with Benzedrine. And I had kept it cured up until recently where I had to have all these kind of other things. I, I just could rest a while and then go back. I, I do it again. And you see, I didn't think I belonged here either. And so uh, I looked around at all them sober, single, good-looking young guys, and I said, I'm going to get me one of those. And I did. <laughs> he was the sickest one there. It had to be. I got radar. But it takes what it takes, and that's what it took for me. 
I came around Alcoholics Anonymous as a visitor for 10 months. In Pomona, when they go, when they, you went, they went around the room in those days, everybody gave their name, and it, when it came to me, I'd say, I'm Angie and I'm a visitor. I'm not an Al-Anon. They kicked me out of Al-Anon, and I'm not an alcoholic, so I'm just a visitor. And nobody ever said you don't belong here. Somehow you understood I've been kicked in the teeth by life and rejected by everybody I come in contact with, and I couldn't have stood any more rejection. You put your arms around me and said the most important words that you and I have to say to one another. Keep coming back. Keep coming back. Do you know what that feels like when you're used to people saying, keep on going, weirdo? What, what a disappointment it was to me when I found out you were telling that to everybody. <laughs> now, I, you know, I feel a little bit uncomfortable or guilty, so I stopped drinking and doubled up on the Milton's and Benzedrine, because that was the poor last poison I went on. And I got weirder, and this guy didn't want to behave, so I tried to kill him. And they don't like for you to kill him when they're sober. And uh, I, I just wanted them to behave, and, and they wouldn't, they would, don't behave. And um, he wants to get rid of me, and I'm not easy to get rid of because I didn't have a backup. So I moved to Pomona to be closer to the action. And I walked into a room one day, and there's this cute little boy talking with big blue eyes and blonde hair. And as you can see, I have an affinity for blue eyes and blonde hair. Today it is blue eyes and gray hair because time does march on. And... Um, <laughs> And he's talking, he says, says he ha don't have a girlfriend, he don't have a car, and he don't have a surfboard. And I think to myself, come here, little boy, I'll take care of you. <laughs> and I did, and I think he thought a Mack truck hit him. And uh, I educated him on sick bras, I'll tell you what. But after their relationship was over, he decided to become a minister. And I'd like to think that somehow, in my small way, I helped push him over to God. <laughs> Now, I don't like women, and I don't trust men, and that doesn't leave you much. And uh, I, I never heard anything here except keep coming back and live happily ever after. And the 12 steps, and I looked at the 12 steps, and how do you take 12 steps? You just read 12 steps. You don't do nothing with them. Besides, that's for you guys. Uh, my case is different. This guy will take care of me. And you know, I am uh, know today that... Uh, I am grateful that this young man came into my life. He is a gentle young man that taught me about gentle men in Alcoholics Anonymous. He was the first man that had ever been kind to me. He was the first man that ever treated me like I was a special somebody in his life. He would bring me up front and introduce me with such pride in his voice as his girlfriend. Me had always been abused and misused by every man that I'd ever fell in, fallen for. And I'd have stayed with that man forever if I could have, because I had a feeling inside of me that said, do anything you want to me, just don't leave me. The terror of abandonment, the terror of being rejected and discarded was so visceral for me, went to the core of my heart. And so I turned my will in my life and followed this man around. And I stayed in this program as long as he stayed committed. But the, when he drank, so did I. It was not my worst drunk. It just seemed to be the most hopeless one for me. And though I drank for two weeks, it, I didn't know at the time, because it wasn't new. Like I had some place in my mind thought I would go back and start over again. It was not. It seemed that it was right where I left off where I couldn't drink and I couldn't be sober and I couldn't live and I could try to kill myself and I couldn't bring myself to sit in front of a train because I knew that there would be no turning back from that when I would be gone. But I couldn't seem to make myself to do that. And I came back because a man named Carson called me on a rainy Wednesday night in December and took me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, my sobriety date is uh, December the 22nd, 1965. That is my sobriety date. And, uh, and I salute you for my sobriety because a victory is not mine. My sobriety belongs to us. I am not a miracle. There has been times that I have said, I am a miracle. 
The miracle is Alcoholics Anonymous that started in a little home, and I am so privileged to meet Bob and his sister that had the eyes to see the beginning that you and I, that you and I have the legacy of today. It just thrills me to no end, and I have now made a complete circle in this program that I have come here and I have seen the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it is awesome in my life. And my journey began. It, you don't have to be desperate to stay sober. It just helps. It just helps <laughs> to have every hope and every dream kicked out of my head and out of my life, you see. I came here desperate. Now you know it doesn't take long for the desperateness to leave. In the beginning, they were all my heroes. Gosh, I loved everybody. Johnny Harris is my hero. It, Johnny Harris inspired the love of Alcoholics Anonymous inside of me. He was sponsored to that young man, and he would say things to me like, the answers to anything and any problems that are in, in your life are between the cover of Alcoholics Anonymous, the first 164 pages. And he said every woman that comes to Alcoholics Anonymous automatically is treated like a lady and uh, deserves to be treated like a lady and conduct herself as such. And you see, I have never, never been a lady by any stretch of the imagination. But I remember when I used to go to those houses that I used to break into and I looked through the window and look at all the, the magic things that normal people lived with that I never had in my life. And so I stayed in Alcoholics Anonymous because I had no place else to go and no pla nobody else to turn to. And you welcomed me and brought me in and taught me. Now, I don't like women anymore just because I'm sober. Uh, the guys were always much more friendlier than the women. And uh, I don't like women that have a lot of time because they look at me. I don't know what they're seeing, but they look at me, and I want to hide from both of them. And I think that they can see something. I don't know what they're seeing, but whatever it is, I don't want them to see it. And today I know, yes, we can, because we walked through those paths before. Uh, and uh, uh, when I would have problems, I would go to some of them, old-timers. And I, in the beginning, I, I thought they were all wonderful, and then after a while, some of them had a little bit of defects around the corner. Then I got to the place where I hated a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't resent. I had trouble identifying resentment because I never had any resentment. Now, I either loved you or I hated you, but I didn't resent you. It was like having a measure stick with zero to a hundred with no numbers in between. And I hated the way this guy looked, talked, walked, smoked, sat, breathed. And I know because I watched him all the time. <laughs> now, he was sober 12 and a half years and didn't know nothing. And the reason I didn't, I knew he didn't know nothing is because he went to a meeting every night. Now, I'm a newcomer. I'm supposed to go every night. They used to say, go to 90 meetings and 90 days and take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. I believe it or not, I had no problem with that. I had no, I knew not to open my mouth here. Because if I you kick me out of here, I'm really screwed because there's no place else for me to go. So I just smiled and kept my mouth shut. Now, I hated this guy diligently. I'd look for him at every meeting. There you, you know, you, there's a, there's a phase in resentment where it feels wonderful, doesn't it? But, you think, <laughs> but somebody would say, resentment are the number one offenders for the alcoholic is fatal. And God, that would scare me. So I went to some of them guys that look like they know like what they're talking about. Got time for like four years, five years. And I said, put my smile. Remember that smile? I said, how do you get over resentment? And they say, turn it over easy, does it. This two shall pass one day at a time. Go home, read the book, keep coming back, and don't drink. <laughs> and so I went, I went home and did this. And then I'd come the next night and look around, and there he was. <laughs> And then again, I said, to her, go on to somebody else. I didn't want to go back to you because you know I was a dummy. And I'm a Mexican. I've got pride here. I don't want to, you don't know I'm a dummy. So 
So I'd go to somebody else and they'd say, oh, turn it over easy, does it, this too shall pass one day at a time. Go home, read the book, keep coming back and don't drink. After a while, I got the message. You don't know the answer either. <laughs> Either that or you're going to find out there's a fraud among you. Maybe I'm not really an alcoholic. One day, somebody said something like, say the serenity prayer for him. This guy had 5,062 million serenity prayers said for him at every meeting. One day he's talking, and he starts to cry. I don't know, he's talking about some dribble, you know, like, Somebody died in his family. I mean, I got real problems, and he's talking about dribble. And uh, he starts to cry. And I'm thinking, how embarrassing. He's crying. Has any ever heard of John Wayne? Iwo Jima? Emiliano Zapata? Pancho Villa? Somebody, for God's sake. He's crying. All his sisters and women cry. And after the meeting, everybody went and hugged him. I said, oh, shoot. I said, I gotta, I mean, I, I gotta go hug him now. And, and I'm, I give him one of them stiff arm hugs, you know, them stiff arm hugs. What I had was bad enough, I just didn't want what he had. So I gave him one of them stiff arm hugs in case what he had was catchy. And, uh, he didn't have any class, he would not accept rejection. He just came right in, put his head on my shoulder, and started to sob. And I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> but something happened. The pain in him reached out and touched the pain in me. What can I tell you? That the likes of you and me know what it is to experience devastating pain. And when I experience this pain, something happened to me. Just like it's happened with anything that is obnoxious that has been removed from me has been as a result of something else. Never head on. Because all that resentment, all that anger, all whatever the ugly feelings I had to this man melted away as if I had never been. And I can really, looking back, trace that that was a day where uh, the book says that we will experience much of heaven for we have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence, the likes of which we had not even dreamed. And I really believe that in that moment is the day that I felt like I belonged there. That I belong there. It is working for me. I was sober nine months. I remember when I had 30 years, somebody came up to me and asked me, how does it feel to be 30 years sober? And I say, the same way it did when I was nine months old. It is new ground. It is new ground. We talk a lot about honeymoon in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know that there's more than me that has experienced the honeymoon continuously in Alcoholics Anonymous. Gratitude has been the key for me to feel grateful for the miracle that has happened in my life. And it's happened to you because we are members of alcoholics. I wish that I could tell you from that day to this, nothing bad ever happened. No, I, all my defects were removed. And I've just held my hand to my higher power and was tiptoed to the, to the, to the clouds. Wrong. It's amazing how those things come up. And I think that they are spiritual experiences different from spiritual awakening. To say, they are like guideposts that say, keep on this way, girl. They are thy the rod and thy staff. They come to me. They push me on the way. They push me on the way. Now, then I start to think again. You know I got to think. And I got to plot. And I got to scheme. And I got to do all those things. So I finally get this young man to marry me. I don't have a sponsor. I had a lady that had volunteered to be my sponsor. And she said, I got to give up that young man or one day he'll give you up. You gotta stay home and be a mother to those girls or one day you'll be sorry. Now I don't know how to be a mother, much less a mother to teenagers. They have out of body experiences. They have alien takeovers at teenagers. And, uh, 
And I don't know how to be without a man. I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about somebody to hold me close and make that lonely, horrible something go away at least for a little while. So I did the most reasonable thing for me is I gave up the sponsor. She made me feel guilty. <laughs> so then I probably finally got this young man to marry me, and, and he was there was 11 years spread in, in our ages, but he was like 11 years older than me in his brain. And, but he, you know, it's quite a feat for him taking up in this responsibility. Two teenage girls, but at 23. And, uh, um, then I got a sponsor. I got a real sponsor. She had 23 years and talked to me in 20, 23 years. And I don't know what she's talking about. But I still can't. I was dry, sober. I were, I took the steps. I did all these things. Uh, but I wasn't really. There's a big difference to me between believing and trusting in a higher power. And that has to come when it comes to me. When I was sober about five years, what happened to me is that we married and had a fairly happy marriage as long as things were going my way. And um, my kids grew up and they started drinking and going into drugs. And I used to pray, God, spare my babies. And he didn't spare my babies. And one day I came home. We had a big fight. They took off. I had one one to run off to Ohio. I didn't even know Mexicans ever went to Ohio. I only went 30 miles from home. I couldn't stand her. And the other one, the oldest one, went to live in a commune and came home one day with a burn the size of a silver dollar in her chest where people had been putting cigarettes out of in my garden. I went into a horrible depression. I know that today there's a lot of medicine for those depressions. Uh, but I am so glad that they were not there at that time. I know today that that imploded fear and that imploded anger uh, is, comes out of depression. I am grateful today that the only thing that I had uh, to go through was what I had to go through. I tried to commit suicide. That young man went and took me to the psycho world, sat, went home, packed his clothes, and left me. And everything that I ever feared came about. And the only reason that I'm standing here this morning is because of the people in Oklahoma Tsunami that came along. The toast burners. You know, toast burners, different from hot burners, they're, they're ladies that, that drank in their kitchen. They came around me and they taught me. It's from the women that I learned to be a lady. So you shared the secrets of your heart with me. And I was finally able to share my shame with you. Because I didn't care what you knew about me before. And I realized we were not so different. Maybe you drank in your kitchen and maybe I drank in bar. But we felt the same shame and dirty about ourselves. In fact, I realized it was harder for you because I didn't have to suck it in for anybody, but you did. And it is from the men in Alcoholics Anonymous that treated me like a lady that I learned to be a lady. But it is because I threw myself completely and into this program without any reservation that I have learned about dignity and self I made peace with my God. I said, okay, God, I'm never going to be happy again. All you ever want me to do is work with a sick women drunk and let them puke on me. All right, all right. And so what I did, I moved back to Orange County. I, uh, we used to go to meetings and take women from recovery houses, take them into my home. I don't know about your higher power, but mine has a weird sense of humor. When I want something so bad, oh, God, can Hail Mary, can our fathers go to confession and mass every Sunday? He don't come. As soon as you say, ah, screw it. Here it comes. I don't know why it works that way. <laughs> when I got to the other side, and you know there's another side that you and I have to go to. When I, the part where I wanted to uh, put a gun about two inches from his belly or run him back down in the freeway and uh, back and forth till he's flat like a tortilla. Uh, I, my sponsor assured me they don't lock you up for being crazy, only for acting crazy. That if God removes all my character defects, that I disappear. And uh, so uh, when I got to the other side, I touched the power and the strength that was way down inside of me. And I knew that after all that's said and done, there's only you and me, God, in me. And I found another answer there. Now, I told you I took these women places and in my home, and they thought I cared. I didn't care. I was just doing it because I'm supposed to do it, not because I cared. 
I mean, I'm, I got too much pain to care for anybody but me. But God throws in the joker. I don't know why. I started acting as if I cared, so they wouldn't know I didn't care. And I started to care him. And something else happened. I find out, found out by me caring for you fills up all the empty places. It fills up the, the, exactly the same way that I thought you loving me would be. It doesn't come from that. It comes from me really caring what happens to you right here. And so my journey has taken many turns, and all of them have been forward. Sometimes it's a little bit tipped, and sometimes not. But I went to work. My children came. They went to work, and I went to school and became self, so I could learn to become self-supporting through my own contribution. I am one of those ladies that had to live alone to find out the difference between being lonely and having solitude. I love living alone. What was I fighting all this all for, for so long? And so uh, I could get married any weekend I wanted. I found out that you know, marriage and, and happiness don't live together. Uh, that uh, the way to ruin a great relationship is to get married. And uh, I'm going along just having the great old time, bought my own new car and uh, lived alone. Just having a one is committed and involved. In fact, I, I ran into a guy here. We used to, a bunch of us used to run together. It made me so grateful that I didn't sleep around in alcoholic anonymous. That I'm not afraid or ashamed to have Richard meet some of the men friends that I have had in alcoholism. I didn't know I wasn't sleeping around. I thought I was. But I guess uh, uh, it helped to have all these friends. And uh, when I was just very involved in alcoholic Anonymous, and my daughter, they grew up, they were still doing their stuff, and I didn't care as long as I wasn't witnessing it. And one got married, and, and was going to have a baby, and it was at that time that I found out what God has wrought inside of me. My sister that had always been held up as an example chose to take her life. And it was my destiny to be the one to find it. And I could not believe what was before my eyes. Death had never touched my life like that. And I fell devastated. And something came together in those days that said, God is the only giver and the only taker of life. And she chose to go, and he let her go home. How many times did I want to die? And I could never die. I could never kill the pain, the madness inside. That I, that he spared me, and he has spared me because I am God's melody of life, and he sings his song to me. Someplace, somewhere, somebody needs to know. The places I come from, and they happen to me. Because his hand is always light, whenever it is heavy. Two weeks after that, I became a grandma. And man, I'm a great grandma. I never knew how to be a mother. But, you know, no, I never even skipped the beat of being a grandma. Huh? I finally found out how to get along with, with kids. Just give them everything they want. <laughs> I fell in love around that time. God, I don't want to fall in love. But I fell in love with a newcomer. And if it offends any spiritual giants, I want you to know that it offended me. Because here I was over 13 years and I fell in love with a newcomer. That was pretty interesting. I tried to hide him. I went to a conference once and, and I, uh, 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 he went with me. And uh, my friend Frank Sloan was there and I thought nobody that I knew would be there. There's always somebody popping up someplace. And he comes over to well and say hi to me and yeah, I'm trying to hide Richard, and Richard don't hide to me. And uh, he says, is he with you? I said, oh, yeah. And he says, he's one of us? Well, hell, he sees his nose is still like Rudolph, and his head's going like those little dogs in the Mexican cars. Go, How long has that guy been sober? I couldn't even... <laughs> he says, Angie, for God's sake, give that guy a break. Let him get sober first. So I go over to my sponsor. My sponsor was Mary Reagan. For those of you that, that remember her, that 
She died last March. She was my sponsor for over 20 years. And I felt safe and loved by my sponsor. And my sponsor loved me. And she never, never treated me with kid love. She was the one that used to say things like, Angie, you don't have to sit in your own shit just because it's warm. <laughs> When I'd go with something that I was very interested in, there was a little shabby. She would say, where are you now, Angie? Some of us just got to eat shit with a rusty spoon till we can't stand it anymore. I tell you, I'm a thief. And when I used to go and speak at conferences, I used to take ashtrays. Not, nothing, just ashtrays, just souvenirs. And she said that for me, it was stealing them. She said, but I'm not stealing them here. You have souvenirs at the places I've been in. Duffy tried to tell her, you know, Duffy tried to tell her, yeah, people there, she said, turn around to me, she said, you shut up. And he did, and everybody knows what a burly guy Duffy is. And uh, she looked at me, and she looked me right in the eye, and she said, I don't know about you, Angie, but my integrity is worth more than an ice cream. Oh, oh. <laughs> The bayonet is still sticking out on the back of me. <laughs> she was my sponsor, and I loved her, and I love her. And whatever, whatever I am today, I am the carrier. I am not the message. I am the messenger, and I am the messenger of this program works that works for the likes of me. And it's a, my my program comes out of that big book. And I am Mary Reagan taught me how to bring the book. And put it into my life, the applicant. She helped me to be accountable. The people that I sponsor keep me accountable. And I went to her when Frank Sloan said that, and I said, Mary! <laughs> and she said, Angie, he's a nice guy. If you don't want him, I'll take him. Well, good enough for my sponsor. She said, just tell him you scooped him in before somebody else did. She said, if you're afraid somebody's going to find out something about you, just tell him. And then you won't be afraid. You see, it is the secret. It is those, those fears that keep me away from you, that keep me in bondage to my selfishness and self -nessiness. So let me tell you who I am. And that's where I am. Because you see, I'm not here because I'm well. I'm here as an example that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works for the life of you. Now, this man whispered in my ear, he was so strange. He wore cowboy hats all the time and those pointed boots all the time and Levi's with, with buckles and had cows and horses. I never knew anybody like that. He came to Orange and, and he was sober one year and I'll tell you how stupid that was for me. I was sober 14 years. He came over and, and I knew him. I knew he was a nice guy. How? I knew, I didn't know what I wanted. I knew what I didn't want. And uh, he came with his horse trailer with all my kiliches in there. And away we went to Blythe to live happily ever after. Wow. It takes a little adjustment. They didn't do it right in Blythe, so I taught him how. First time I'd gotten bad language toward me in Alcoholics Anonymous. But I'm not a slouch in that area myself. So, um, <laughs> now today, there's something about a redneck community that here comes a big mouth. Mexican woman that's got more sobriety than them, telling them what to do. So uh, they don't listen well. So I'm I'm pretty smart, and I'm not all too stupid. I, I sponsor this man. It's a man, white, Anglo-Saxon, uh, wasp, and I sponsor him, and he runs the group. But Mama oversees the group. <laughs> We're little and bright, but we're mighty. You know, we we take this this program very, very seriously, but we don't take ourselves as serious. We know that the miracle is all gone tonight. And I look to tomorrow. My sponsor taught me how to be accountable, but the people that I sponsor keep me accountable. I still do, and probably I didn't do it all in the beginning, but I'll tell you what I do. I go to meetings. I read the book. 
I would take those steps and practice them in my life. And I thank you. And I am thankful. I told you that my sponsor lost my sponsor last March. And I went to, I went the last mile with my sponsor. When she was terminal, I called her up and asked her if I could bring her something. She said, yes, bring me some Snickers. Bring me two bags of Snickers. So I went to, to Smart and Final and brought two big bags of Snickers. And, and I said, is there anything else? She said, yes, you go to bring me some perfume and some, don't bring me any other Mexican perfume. Bring me something light. That's how, so I went over there and got her something light. She wanted the Snickers for, to be the, the big mama there with a the nursing staff and stuff. Give him Snickers. And she looked at Richard and she said, I should have taken you when I had a chance. And uh, she's so terminal here. And uh, so I go home and I sent her a beautiful bouquet of flowers with a big purple orchid and says, you are the best man. So I call her up because I want my edibles, right? I want my, so I call her. She says, oh, that's great. The nurse is da 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 You know how she did. And then I asked, is there anything else I can bring you? And she said, uh, send me some more Snickers, they're all gone. And I, this is Friday, and I said, Mary, I can't, uh, how about if I send you some cheesecake? No, I want Snickers. So I went on Friday and bought her a two pound, uh, two pounds of Snickers, cost six dollars, and spent twenty dollars to overnight them suckers, so she'd have them on Saturday. And I called her up, she, I said, did you get your Snickers? She said, yes, thank you, you're a good girl. You're a good girl. She said, Angie, you are my best friend. And she died in months. And we had a memorial. And it was about five hours. But you see, I went to the memorial. Because I'm going the last mile with my son. And Clancy was her son. And Clancy and their oldest son gave me her big book. It is in my Mary Reagan show. And um, I got another lady. I don't expect her to take the place of anybody. But it is a new adventure. And I gotta have somebody when I'm in a dilemma to guide you. I wanna tell you that there's peace and love in our family. Both my daughters are members of our theology. And we are friends. And because every so often, God Disclose something that says you're on the right path. Next Saturday night at the Women's International at the bank, my youngest son will be the speaker. The blessings of God. <laughs> my granddaughter, my granddaughter, God bless her. She's gorgeous and she goes out gorgeous and come back comes back in the morning. Two days later. Mm-hmm. Here, got long hair now, they don't wear it over. Mm-hmm. And she's got I've got two daughters, two granddaughters, and one great grandson that stays with us most of the time. And this little boy, I ask him, Andre. Do you know if Granny loves you? He said, yes. And he just hugs and gets on top of me and cleans out everything in my heart. And the other day I said, Andre, you smell. Did you wipe that when you go to the bathroom? He said, I farted on you, Granny. I I think he's so different from them little girls out there. I'm going to knock you on the other side of that next week. <laughs> he feels loud and he feels good. There, is a, there isn't a day that goes by that the people that I love don't hear from me. There's peace and happiness and harmony in our home today because we are members of our God. And he has touched us. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for
for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.